Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the School of Motion Workflow Show. I am your host today, EJ Hassenfratz. And today, I feel like of all people on the internets in the motion design world, these, these two knuckleheads probably don't need any introduction at all. And probably a lot of us owe a lot of our careers to them. Uh, but welcome, please welcome, warm welcome. I want to hear the applause out there, the little clapping emojis to Nick Campbell and Chad Ashley of Grayscale Gorilla. Thank Woo! you. Hey, wow, hey. What an intro. Wow. Yeah, good. look at that. Good to see you, man. Good to see you guys, too. It's it's good to see everyone's faces, and hopefully we can all see each other in person soon. Uh, but basically, today we're going to be talking all things render, how to make beautiful renders. And also, there's some exciting stuff happening at Grayscale Gorilla, specifically GSG+. Plus. I've been following so much of the progression of how GSG Plus has kind of evolved over the past, you know, year or so. And man, it's a completely different product and it's amazing. And I tell everyone I can about it because it's it's really improved my workflow, made me work faster. Uh, but so what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk about renders. We're going to talk about GSG Plus, all the stuff, exciting stuff at Grayscale Gorilla. We're also going to be taking live Q&A throughout. So do send all your q and a's in the uh youtube chat and if it's good and nick likes it if chad likes it we'll, we'll <laughs> test we it it'll be yeah up or down like <laughs> like in gladiator good we'll question the questions. hover yeah we'll hover like ooh, the suspense and uh so yeah keep the q a coming all throughout um we're also going to be uh raffling off some uh, some prizes at the end, so definitely stick to the end of the stream. So uh, let's get started. We got the iced coffee already going. I love it. Oh, I man. love it. Got to do I it. I finished mine. So, dude, I'm obsessed with this new glass I've got. It's insulated. It's glass. Oh, so it's like got sweet. air pockets in there. Extra got cold. The tin yeah. cup. That's it's good too. Good old tin cup. So how are you guys doing? been a little crazy i know it's been busy over at grayscale gorilla for sure you guys been, are doing live streams again which i am loving yeah we've been slammed uh we've been working real hard the team's been rocking behind the scenes making a bunch of new stuff for plus and uh, we brought the uh the live show back we're on kind of a summer break right now but uh after the summer we're going to get back to uh, a q a format where we just answer your cinema 4d questions we uh, we really focus in on answering the like how do we make this stuff look good questions and i'm, I'm sure we'll have a few of those today um but we want to focus in on you know of all the crazy stuff you could do in 3d and cinema 4d what are those tips and tricks that help you make stuff look more realistic um make help you work faster make it look, look more lifelike all those kind of things we kind of focus in on that so I'm, I'm i'm hoping we get into some of that today as well so i'm uh, excited man I thought this was a relationship advice show. <laughs> Caller, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry Springer. I, I, this was like... not, I was not ready for this, but I'll, I'll Sorry, do my Chad. best. Sorry, Chad. You're going to have to talk about rendering in 3D today. <laughs> I, uh, I know I know you're not a big fan. What are you I'm really trying to segue into, into relationship advice. but <laughs> you're sw switching yeah. it up. Is that, was that ACES? Is that what that stands for? <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's actually the name of my new company that's yeah. <laughs> focused on helping you in your relationship. <laughs> Welcome to ACES, a new talk show. Right, we need, uh, so we yeah, need let's, acronym by the end of this episode. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Everyone drop their best ACES ac an acronym <laughs> meaning in the chat, and uh, we'll make a T-shirt out of it. Um, so yeah, let's start about like how the heck do you create the beautiful renders? How do I get good, guys? Um, let's just kind of start about talking with uh, about like what do you think is the most important aspect of creating that beautiful render um I'll, let me tell a quick story ej because i think it is is how a, a lot of artists out there might feel when i started learning 3d i um cinema 4d was, was i was obsessed with it right i'm playing with this tool it does a lot there's a lot going on and i learned all about you know mograph was coming out and and basics on how to model stuff and okay i'm learning a little bit more about materials and as I kind of put all this stuff together, I started to get to the rendering point where you actually hit the button and watch the buckets or watch the lines back in the day. And I was always looking at my render and comparing it to all the work on that I've seen online and always wondering like, what am I missing? 
like there must be something I'm missing that is not that 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 will help make my scene look more like the stuff I see on TV or more like the stuff I see on my favorite ad or you know whatever. And um, I happen to be working next to one of the best 3D artists uh, around, Chad Ashley. Uh, I was we were working at the same place, and he was lucky, uh, or I was lucky enough to be able to listen to him and learn some of these tips and tricks really early on in my career. Uh, and one of the biggest things he taught me, and I'm still learning today, is how to look at your 3D render like a cinematographer uh, or even a photographer, right? How to, how to think about your render in real life. How would you go about shooting it? What types of materials and dents and scratches would be of, uh, in that scene? What type of lighting would you use? What types of cameras would you use? And we might dig into some of the details around that, but the biggest unlock for me, and I think hopefully it's helping other 3D artists out there that are maybe just getting started, is thinking about your render as a cinematographer, as a director, and not just as a bunch of 3D stuff on a screen. So that that to me was kind of a big unlock. Um, Chad, you you have anything to add to that? Uh, man, I, I agree. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have lately kind of been telling folks, uh, and I've, I've seen a couple other people do this too, uh, telling folks to take a break from uh, 3D tutorials on YouTube and go watch some photography tutorials on YouTube. And it, especially if you aren't familiar with photography, you're not familiar with maybe how cameras work, then that's a great place to go to just understand the mechanics of it and, and try to see how these connections can be made between an actual camera and the camera that you're using in 3D because really that's what you're doing. You're capturing everything in 3D with a camera. So it kind of makes sense to kind of learn how those work and really kind of hone those skills. If you don't have a camera, it's a great idea. Go grab uh, a camera. It doesn't have to be like super crazy expensive or fancy. In fact, it, it could be uh, one from a, from a you know, secondhand store or something. But learning how they work is a great is a great place to start. But there's not like one answer to getting better looking renders. There's not like a magic answer that I can just be like, yes, do this or buy this or use this. And it's a combination of a lot of things. It's composition, it's light, it's camera work, it's subject matter, it's all these different things, materials, all these different things combine to make a really compelling image or video or movie. And it's just honing those skills that maybe you're not so sure about. If it's a camera thing, then pick up a camera. Watch these other videos on photography. If it's uh, materials, join Grayscale Gorilla Plus. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's like something around motion, study film. I mean, th it, there's a lot of different answers to that question, but more than anything, time. It just takes time. Yeah, I think that's where... Uh things started to open up for me because, you know, it's hard. We have a lot of people in definitely the school of motion audience uh, that are primarily 2D animators. And when I was primarily working in 2D, number one, I was working in news graphics. At no point did I think about like, what's the lighting of this gunshot victim uh, thing <laughs> I need to put on a over the shoulder graphic or whatever. So like I, I'm, I'm, I was totally self-taught and you know, what you gravitate to is like all the sexy, shiny things. Like let's learn cinema 4d and throw reflective materials on it. And I don't know how to light, but this looks cool. Right. I don't know. I have a bad eye for this. Um, and, well, and even that, in, oh, go ahead. No, I think that everybody has it within them because we've all studied film. We all grew up watching movies and we have, we have a, an understanding of, of how light can affect emotion just be, by being a human and watching TV and movies, right? So it's a matter of like, okay, let me figure out, let me reverse engineer why that looks good or why I feel the way I do when I watch Blade Runner or Goonies or whatever, you know? And, and just think about it in those terms. And I think all that's missing is that connective tissue. Like, you know, kind of the emotion of that gun gunshot victim title <laughs> that you want to do obviously it's got to be like foreboding and probably scary and a gun yeah right exactly so if if you can kind of imagine what you want the viewer to, to feel when they look at that graphic and then think about a movie or an image or something that you've seen in your life that gave you those emotions then go find that thing and reverse engine oh it looks like it's bottom lit let me try that or looks like it's using like really harsh shadows let me try that yeah and that 
it's important to understand that the language of film and the language of commercial and photography, um, the language of putting something beautiful in a rectangle has been around so long and we all grew up watching films and movies and cartoons that have uh, utilized this language, even if we didn't know it, right? That exactly. it's so important to study that language because that is what your clients are asking you for if they know it or not. They're asking you to interpret what they're trying to sell, the message they're trying to get across, or you as an artist are trying to get across. And we have this 100 plus year you know, language of film and photography that we can draw on that is really that connective tissue between a render that is lit and has a material on it and is technically kind of the subject you're looking for versus something that grabs you, holds an emotion to your face, uh, tells you to think and feel a certain way. Like we, there's so much power in in this language that it's it's um, one of the most important things you could do to um, to to create more impactful, better looking. You know, there's there's a lot of ways to say it. So much so that even early on, when I when I first discovered HDRI lighting, it was like a breakthrough for me because it made so much sense. Like, oh, we could just capture lighting in the world and kind of spit it back into 3D land and you get all the benefits of all the details and all the HDR and all the little cracks in the wall and little light reflections and you get it into 3D. And of course I went out and tried to capture an HDR and bring it in and I lit it and I was like, well, that's really cool and all, but it still looks like this thing is in my living room. And you know what? It was, it was the same lighting that was just sitting in my living room. That was my first HDR. And that's when I realized you can't just capture any old random light on these things. You need to capture beautiful light. You need to capture a, a way that studios are lighting objects. You need to go wait for um, you know, the magic hour on the beach and then capture the HDR. You don't wanna capture it at, at noon because as a photographer, I knew that that lighting it does not create a good emotion, right? So all these things kind of came into play as I was learning 3D, and it, it just always was a reminder for me to study how films were made. When they turn the camera on to make a beautiful scene for a movie might be when we need to turn our camera on to make great HDRIs, for an example. So mm -hmm. connecting all those things together and realizing um, it always comes back to an emotion and filmmaking and using the the same language that that has been around for 100 plus years i think for the majority of my 3d career i totally didn't even make the connection i think i'm just slow i mean chat will know <laughs> chat will know a little bit of that uh, <laughs> you're uh, not you're not slow EJ. Uh, but the garlic ice cream sounded so good <laughs> oh, that's an inside joke yeah. uh but I mean, Goal. really, we have we have a lights camera render, which David Airy have t taught. And, you know, I was lucky enough to creative direct that and watch everything while he was making it. And like he has lessons where it's just like, let's do some film study. And I'm like, holy crap. Like I'll watch movies. Right. Like I'll watch movies. I'll listen to music. And I still can't tell you, like, why do I like certain music and why don't I like certain? I couldn't tell you or communicate to you why. Like, what is it about the music that I like or the style or whatever? I feel like that was a lot of how I couldn't communicate why I like a certain movie. Like, I love Pacific Rim. Why do I like it? Well, now I am actually equipped with, like, all the film language and, like, the lighting language and stuff like that. And I feel like I have a better vocabulary, like, visual vocabulary to be able to, like, understand what's going on, why I like it. Even learning all of the different ways of where you position a light and what that does. Like that was a huge eye opening thing for me. And like, I agree with uh, Chad. I think Chad said where, you know, if you want to get better at lighting, don't Google C4D lighting tutorial, just do studio lighting tutorial. There's great people that there's, there's some YouTube channels out there where they just critique studio lighting setups from like photography students that are just doing uh, studio lighting. And it's, mind-blowing what you can learn because everything is one-to-one -one. only you have like yeah. the full flexibility of you don't have to like physically move this light here to someplace yeah. else to get at a rim and see what that looks like and especially with third-party renders i think that's where 
things really started to click for me because it was so limiting to experiment with lighting and you know standard physical render and now it's like oh i don't have to wait to do this and i can really start to learn because i get that instant feedback of what is this light doing and what happens when i move it here versus here how does that make me feel uh and stuff like that yeah a hundred percent that was huge for me too was the third third party rendering revolution that we've gone through in the last you know five plus years um the ability to grab a light move it around and see it in almost uh real time how it affects the render, how it uh, how it gives shadow, how the gradient falls across the front of something, and and you forget how you can do this in real life. Uh, and and this is a little bit of what Chad was talking about. Uh, grab your even your iPhone, set it up, try to put it on some sort of tripod thing. Grab one light, maybe grab your old iPhone and make it a, a flashlight like rectangle, and literally move it around your your object, and you'll get. 50 different emotions just from one light and one camera angle. Do, how, do you want it to be bright and happy? Do you want it to be mysterious? Do you want it to be only in, in silhouette? There are so many things you can do with one or two lights and, and one camera angle that will start to influence uh, what you're trying to go for. And, and you said it too, uh, a great one to realize, EJ, is next time you see a, a film that you love, a still image that you love, clip it out, you know, like take a screenshot of it and study it and think about what attracted me to this and what techniques are they using that I can try to replicate in my scene. So if they have a, a cool watch or a car or, or, you know, I don't know, something stood off the screen to you that you were, th that you stopped scrolling and paid attention to, well, shoot, that's what a lot of our clients are asking us to do for them. So why not take a break, study exactly why these things stood out to you as, as a human, right? Learn the, the lighting techniques, learn the, maybe even the color theory behind a lot of what's happening and, and try to apply it to your next render. And, and that's, what, that's what we try to focus on when we you know, not only create training, but our tools is giving you, know, giving you access to the same tools that a professional lighting um, uh, person would have in a studio, uh, but here in, in 3D so that you can use these these techniques in real life to to influence your your 3d runners anything to add yeah, to I, I, yeah i think that I, I touched on something in there that i wanted to expand on which is the idea of, of reference and i truly think that like every um you're only as good as your reference and if you if you don't have really good reference that you're using to try to like match the look or the feel uh, to your work, every amazing artist, every every artist that you're like, oh my god, that what they created was insanely amazing. It's so so cool. Guarantee they have like a giant pure ref uh, reference board on their monitor at all times, informing decisions, helping get helping them get into the flow of whatever the the vibe that they're trying to create. So the idea of when you see something, snip it out, save it. Uh, start keeping like a, uh, a scrapbook of ideas and images that kind of speak to you or things that you might want to come back to later. For me, I use, I use Pinterest uh, primarily because it has a really great capture method and I can capture anywhere. So if I see something that's interesting that I might want to dissect later, I just throw it into Pinterest and then I can go back and actually organize it later. So I can say, oh, you know, this is something product lighting related. I want to come back to that because that was cool. I want to dissect that. So start building a reference pile for yourself and, and really uh, try to be vigilant about it because I think good reference can always help make good imagery. Yeah, I agree. I, for some reason, for the longest time, I was just like, if I'm looking at things like I'm just like, I, I, I'm, I, it's not original or something. So I need to make this up from scratch or like no pre-planning at all. And I just jump into 3D and just start throwing lights around. And you quickly realize how fast you just start spinning your wheels because you don't know what the hell you're doing, why you're doing it. And yeah, when I started looking at reference and mood boards and, and actually having a direction, you takes a lot of the guesswork out. You have a, Absolutely. a North Star to, to go towards and you try to replicate that, uh, that lighting setup or that mood or, or whatever. Um, and I feel like for 3D artists, especially coming from the 2D side of things, like After Effects, you don't have to 
learn three point lighting. Like you're all dealing with flat layers and sometimes they're 3D and, you know, to, to jump over to the 3D world, unless you really were a film geek or, you know, learned that in college or something like that, you're kind of just learning from square one. And I feel like that is definitely my journey. And I've been trying to, you know, backpedal and be like, okay, this is where I need to start from. And now I can proceed. And now I start to understand all these uh, things and, you know, better late than never, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's um, exa exactly what happened to me, EJ, is I went th already went through this with learning After Effects and like, why why is all my stuff so ugly? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I learned what I missed in After Effects was design theory, right? So color theory, typography, um, more flat 2D kind of like traditional magazine style design, right? And the more I learned about traditional color type layout, the better my After Effects work. But you're you're one hundred percent right. As soon as you move to three D, there's a there's so many more um, so many more parts of it that you that you need to understand. Your materials, lighting, um, and obviously the the ability to model and create a whole three D world from scratch uh, are three things you just just really couldn't pull off in After Effects. So it was understanding that now I need to study the how light wraps around objects, and now I need to study you know, how dust in the air kind of like subtly adds a little glow around things and how to replicate that in, in 3D. I needed to study, you know, great lighting, great materials. Um, and and you said another thing I just wanted to touch on, which is this idea that we, we to be like a real artist, you have to like start from scratch. I, f I feel like a lot of us have that thought in our head, like, man, we have to uh, be 100% unique or authentic or whatever that part is. And I think there's a time to, to do that. But when, when clients are asking you <laughs> to do something on budget and on time, there is no way anybody can do this stuff from scratch. Um, we all rely on, on taking uh, the parts of the animation or the parts of the render that are very important and spending all of our time there and then taking the secondary and, and tertiary things in the render that maybe are in the background or something, you know, like uh, a material in the background or the, or the table it's sitting on and not building all of that from scratch, not starting from scratch every time because every artist, if they're doing this for a living, they do not build everything from scratch. They rely on, on pre-made models, materials, lighting, and focus in on the things that really matter to the client and really matter to the story of what they're trying to tell. So I think that is um, something I definitely felt as an artist, but quickly realized working in production that there's just no way you have to you have to be able to um, you know only take your time and focus on the most important piece and use some pre-made objects for a lot of the other pieces. Right, right. Now, as far as uh, like. Because we, we're having some questions like, you know, I, I, I try to watch tutorials on lighting and stuff and it's just not sticking. Uh, I feel like there's some commonly known, like most common mistakes that people make as far as like lighting goes and cameras and even materials. So maybe we can kind of touch on some of the most common mistakes as far as we'll start with lighting. Like, what do you think are mm. some of the things you always see coming up again and again that people are doing wrong as as far as lighting goes? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on this one. Um, the most common mistake is too many lights. The most mm. common mistake I see is people, you know, I'll, see, I'll get a scene file or see a scene file and it's got like 13, 15 lights in there. And it's just like... And they're whoa. just rim lights. Yeah, I don't even know. Like, I, I'm, <laughs> I, so just like try to get away with using absolutely uh, as mi as few lights as you possibly can. And for me, I always start if I'm doing something that um, is in what I call in situation. So if I'm lighting something that needs to feel like it's in a, a physical space and not in a void, like a you know a render of something just floating around in black and a void. I'm always starting with an HDRI to just kind of put me in the place that I think might fit. And then from there, I'm adding to that with area lights to bring out certain things. But if I have more than like, if, if it's a simple scene, I shouldn't have more than three or four lights. 
if it's a complicated scene with different set points, then I might have a lot more lights, but it, that's a completely different situation. If I'm not doing in-situation lighting, meaning that it's maybe uh, a product on a black void, uh, I'm going to light that mostly with, with quad lights, area lights, and then I might have an HDRI providing fill or providing some sort of texture to the background of the, you know, the dark areas of, of the object. Um, but I try to keep it minimal. I try to like, if I'm, if I find myself going down a rabbit hole of adding more lights because it's not feeling right, then I take a step back and I strip it all down and I, I, I rethink it and don't be afraid to like scrap it all and just start over and like build it up one by one, turning, soloing your lights as you go and just making sure that it's, it's vibing right and just try to not get into that, uh, that hole of like just adding more lights. Well, I'll just add more lights. I need a little highlight here, add more light. Try to do more with less. Yeah, I 100% I agree on that one. I think another common mistake that I've seen is, is uh, too much front light or, or too straight on from the front. Um, so the, the, the biggest offender is obviously like uh, Cinema 40 has like a default light on, you know? And, and I think it's easy to just kind of fall into like, that's how your scene looks. And of course, when you want to replace it with a, a area light or something else to kind of roughly match it, because that's what you've been looking at while you, you modeled your object. And those front lights are great when you're modeling. Those front lights are great when you're setting up your scene and where everything is. But, but front lights uh, do not tell a good story. They're not flattering. There's a reason why when uh, you get your photo taken that they try to move the flash as, as far away from the lens as they can because it, it creates more uh, flattering light. It gives better shape to your objects, right? A flat on light is very, it's flat, right? You, you don't get a lot of shape um, in your scene. So the more that you can move your light away from where your camera is, um, uh, almost always it will, it will produce a more um, flattering and more eye-catching scene. So my, what I would recommend, uh, especially for beginners, is to place your first light n almost like not in the first 180 degrees of your object, of your main object at all. See what you could do by placing a light next to it, off to the side, ab above, off to the back and kicking in and try to maybe a, a give shape and a rim light to, to your object. Um, and like Chad said, this is different if you're trying to set up like a, a nighttime Tokyo scene with a million lights in it. But if you are trying to, to do like one major object, um, I would focus in on creating your side light first, your rim light, your, your, um, your highlight off to the side first, getting that emotion down and then, do, and then maybe adding a fill light uh, more toward the front to fill in some of the detail. Or like Chad said, use an HDRI to fill in little reflective details and to give it a sense of space, but relying on area lights and uh, quad lights to uh, create the major sense of, of, of space and, and light for your scene. Yeah, it's all about the shadow. It's all about shadow. And it's like, what are you, uh, don't, uh, yeah, absolutely right. And to build off of what, what Nick was just saying is like, don't be afraid of dark. You know, like, don't be afraid of dark. Like, it's okay. <laughs> if you watch a movie, like, watch watch a movie. Uh, uh, my good buddy, uh, Jeremy Stewart, he's a colorist, and he, he was, he will often, like, screenshot movies and just for his own reference, you know, like, really cool color grades and lighting and stuff. And he was showing me some of the screenshots that he had taken, and he was putting them into a histogram. And he was like, look at this. And he showed, like, I forget what, it might have been, like, um, the newer Blade Runner or something like that. Uh, and I was amazed at how all the information was in the dark shadows. There was like nothing over 30% like value. It was all sitting in the dark. And that felt feels totally natural for us. Like, don't be afraid to make things dark because that is part of the mood. That might be part of what you're trying to convey. And I think a, a, a big mistake is everybody wants to make the brightest part white and the darkest part black. And things can sit in the high end or the low end. I, I recommend, uh, you know, watch a movie, uh, maybe like, I don't know, like 
Alien or some some Ridley Scott esque type movie. Screenshot it, bring it into Photoshop. I guarantee you, when you look at the histogram, it's all going to be sitting in the low end, and you're going to be like, "Oh my gosh!" Like I never thought about just having everything slightly underexposed to make it feel mysterious. Not black, obviously, but it's just you, don't be afraid to like play around in the shadows. That sounds really weird. <laughs> As Did I said you it, see? I was like, did you see that Game of Thrones episode that everyone was freaking out about? Because they're like, oh, it's so dark. Yeah, yeah, it's all, thing. yeah, yeah, it was so all. So was every, were they right? And everyone else was like stupid. And it's like, no, that's the, that's the whole thing. That, I mean, I think that, they, that's a perfect example. That yeah. is a good example. It's, I think it's more of a, uh, it's more of a lesson on how nobody calibrated their TV <laughs> correctly. No, I, well, that's, <laughs> that's definitely part of it. But, okay, but, but this is actually a really good scene to talk about because, what was the emotion they were trying to convey in that scene? It's, and for those of you who haven't seen it, it's like the epic, uh, you know, the White Walker zombies are coming to kill them. And they all they shot fire arrows into the zombies and all the arrows went out. You don't see how they went out, but you assume that the zombies killed everybody. So what's that emotion? They, they want you to feel as scared and lost as everybody down there, not sure what's in the dark. And that's exactly why they did that. It wasn't because they screwed up and get, didn't expose things right. It was completely story-driven. And that is a brilliant uh, example, EJ. Yeah, the, the, the shadows, the dark, the ability. I, I can imagine somebody watching that scene leaning in, right? Exactly. Almost, almost yeah. like trying to see. And, oh, of course, you know, horror films exploit this a lot. Like, so dark. Uh, what is going on? Can I move a little closer? Um, and... Yeah, it, 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 I guess it, it's continuously coming back to filmmaking, the visual language, and just understanding how how humans uh, see see things too. Like you mentioned shadows and gradients, and understanding that that's the only way. Even just the way our eyeballs work is about contrast, and it's about um, the differences in things that we notice more than the similarities. So. Um, understanding how that works and, and just, just co continuously looking at your own work and applying those those types of things. I feel like we haven't given a Cinema 4D tip yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's but, the whole point, right? That's, that's what's is, actually important. Yeah, yeah it, it is. It's about, no, you have to know, you know all this stuff about Cinema 4D, obviously, and 3D to get this stuff done. But it's almost taking that part of your brain off for a second and, and turning off the 3D part that says I modeled this or I lit it and I did this and, and turning it into a scene that you would um, uh, maybe see in a film and think of it that way for a, a, a second and then put your Cinema 4D hat back on and, and get working. So it is a huge part of, of um, you know, it's a huge step in the process of making more realistic looking and more compelling looking renders. Yeah, I think the one thing that I always made a mistake about was just like not lighting intentionally. Like none of my lighting had any point to it. It was just like, I'm trying to make something cool. And does this <laughs> look cool? And, and when you start asking yourself like, well, what do I want the viewer to feel what kind of mood am I going for? And even beside from that, like the whole point of lighting is to allow the viewer to communicate, like communicate to the viewer. What is this thing? What do they want to feel? And a lot of times, like, I would light and I'd go back like some of my earliest lighting stuff. And I'm like, this is blown out. Like you can't even tell this is a 3d object. Like it's a cube, but you can't even read that the other side has like a darker shade to it. So it just reads right. it's flat. And I feel like there's, that's a lot of uh, mistakes. Uh, I see at, at least as well. It's like you have the details of your object, but are you, are you communicating that to, anyone in the, the whole painting with light. And I always think of like Bob Ross, like how does he paint? He's got the big oh, brush man. strokes first and then he starts blocking out some of the detail. And then he adds that he gets the little brush out and starts adding all the little highlights and stuff like that. And I feel like yep. that's how I like to light the Bob Ross way. <laughs> you sit there out with an easel and you're, you tease your hair out. Exactly. Yeah. I get yeah. my perm wig and yeah, yeah I dude, go to town. Dude, that's great. Yeah. Uh, we see things through shadow. I mean, that's how, that's right. how we, that's how we see depth is how does light play? How does the sun play off of things? And that's really how we're able to sense scale. That's how we're able to sense depth, all these things. So shadow really informs the viewer of the shape. So if you flatten out your, your lighting with a bunch of front lights, like Nick was saying, 
then you've completely robbed them of the ability to sense the shape. So don't do that. <laughs> we got some good comments and questions coming in the chat. Uh, MWM JSP says, uh, also when lighting in 3D, turn on, turn all your lights off and turn them back on one by one to see what each light's doing in your scene. I know that's like what Chad was saying. It's like, you're using, like don't use a ton of lights. There's so many times where I'd start adding, slinging lights around and then you like start soloing some of these lights and it's like, that was doing nothing or that was overblowing something like that. Right. Um, and, and you can and, also render out light AOVs now. So you can render out each light contribution to its own pass and then do the, like, don't make any harsh decisions in the render, like save that for the comp. And maybe you want to completely change it up in the comp. Now you have that ability if you're saving light AOVs, light groups. Uh, another good comment from MWMJSP. Uh, he says more, he or she says, more over to gain a greater understanding and appreciation of light. I highly recommend uh, drinking from the fountain of Renaissance, Baroque, and neoclassical painters. Like that's, yes. like they masters of lights. Uh, they're some of those painters and just the the uh, the uh, Rembrandt. Like we have a type of lighting called Rembrandt lighting because of the way he would uh, paint the light on the, the face to get, get the face red uh, nicely. Yeah. And expressionism too. Like you mentioned Bra Brass and sometimes you don't need to get into the mi minute molecular detail of a material texture or whatever sometimes it's just the hint of it that's enough you know like that little little brush that he that he does the highlights with it's just a dab of paint but you stand back and you're like that's a highlight on an eyeball right yeah just a tiny tiny dot you ever yeah. see those paintings where they have like a, a reflect uh, like a reflective sphere in there and they actually paint all the reflective detail of the scene in that sphere that oh, like yeah. shiny object that's insane but it but up close it's just like a blob of stuff yeah. you stand back and you're like that's a room oh my god yeah yeah it's crazy um let's maybe go on to uh yeah keep the questions and comments coming in the chat for sure uh we got a few more that i'll get to a little bit later but let's maybe move on to we talked about lighting mistakes and stuff like that let's move on to cameras and what is the most common mistakes you see in cameras uh and and what are your thoughts about changing that default camera length <laughs> focal length from there do you uh, ever do you ever we have we have strong feelings either? about that very strong feelings <laughs> yeah don't don't let your software tell you what camera to use um <laughs> it's uh it's it, I, I won't say too much because i i chad definitely Look, I learned I learned all this stuff from Chad, so I'm gonna let him talk. But I I think understanding that you, you know a, a a filmmaker has a bag full of lenses for a reason. Uh, just like we talked about with lighting, the lens you choose, how close or far away you are from your object, um, it, how you choose to frame your object in the scene, whether you're below your object, whether you're above your object, all have different film language. Um, uh, results and so it is up to you to understand what these lenses do so think learn why why they would grab a 50 millimeter or a 20 millimeter or a hundred millimeter and start to use those uh, to inform your scene as well and I I would say if anybody's sitting with 3d in front of them right now or today like grab an object grab a some model whatever put a basic texture lighting on it and grab three different cameras grab a uh, 20, 28 millimeter, a 50 millimeter, and a 100 millimeter, and fr try to frame the object somewhat the same with all three lenses. And you'll see w the only difference there is the lens that you, cho you chose, and you'll see drastically different feeling and emotion right away with that. So uh, it just, again, goes back to studying what these things do, picking the right lens and camera for your scene, and, and experimenting with it. So much so, Chad actually made a, a, a plugin that lets you choose your camera lenses just like a, a, a DP with a, a bag full of lenses. So you could sit there in Cinema 40 and dial in the exact same types of uh, uh, lens types right in Cinema and see the result right away. Um, so I, I would recommend that one. Chad, I'm sure you have more to say about uh, kind of cameras and lenses and, and how, to, how to go about this. I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'd... I don't want to repeat what you just said, but yeah, that's exactly it. Like, I mean, obviously the 35 millimeter lens that's default can work in a lot of situations. That's why 
it's the default because it's the most uh, similar to the human eye. And I think there's a, there's a site that um, you should go check out called uh, Film Grab. And this site basically just takes screenshots of movies and they put them up there in a searchable database. So you can go out there and like study uh, some cinematography. And really that's what it's all about, about choosing the right lens. You kind of have to, you know, you don't have to know the, um, maybe you don't want to know or, or get into the, to the uh, theories of cinematography and you just want to make it look like a movie. Well, you can go to the site and uh, you might not be able to tell exactly what lens they're using, but there's some telltale signs if you, if you know anything about cameras, which is, you know, the, the flatter the subject and the more bokeh, it's probably going to be a longer lens, which means it's probably going to be like a 50, 75, 100 millimeter. Uh, if there's a lot of focus in the whole shot and you're seeing a lot of stuff on the sides, it's probably a wide angle lens. And you can start to see why DPs use the lenses that they do. If they're going for something intimate, if they're going for something detail, uh, like a punch in, a close up, um, it's going to be a long lens, most likely. If it's a medium shot, then you're, th you're looking at, it could be uh, a sort of long lens if it's a dialogue shot, and it could be a bit wider if they're trying to get more of an establishing medium. And then establishing wide shots are generally all over the, it's a mixed bag. Like if it's a uh, establishing shot of a, uh, you know, a building somewhere, and maybe it's a drone, so it's a long lens or a wide lens. Just go on there and get inspired about what other DPs are doing and think more like a DP. I know we've said that probably like five times already, but um, studying uh, their decisions will help you start to hone and, and flex those muscles to make those decisions in your own work. And I want to mention, uh, Jacqueline posted this in the chat, but um, you, on the Grayscale Gorilla YouTube channel, you guys have a lot of Q&A live streams you guys have done that you guys really dive deep into lighting materials like what makes uh for realistic looking materials cameras camera work and stuff like that and it's a lot more that uh to, that we could fit in a short little pod uh, little live stream we have here so definitely uh check out the grayscale gorilla youtube channel and i'm, I'm assuming you guys are going to be doing more q a i know i've learned a ton and love hearing more about all this theory stuff and and you know just because i feel like i've finally opened my eyes to the importance of all the DP <laughs> stuff since, uh, you know, watching LCR and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, the uh, Check out the live shows. If, if any of these topics, I think we did two on cameras, maybe two on lighting and at mm -hmm. least one or two on materials as well. Uh, and that was basically the last season of the live show. And a lot of them are questions directly from, um, you know, plus customers of ours, people doing uh, work, you know, every day in Cinema 4D asking some of these questions. We answer those questions. We even do a lot of, uh, uh, Chad does a lot of great screen sharing showing exactly how he tackles these uh, kind of ideas. And, you know, th this was something that we're, we're really excited to do more of in the next season, which is, you know, there's so many things you can learn about Cinema 4D or your 3D package, how it works, how MoGraph works, how dynamics work. And I, I love that stuff too. But what we kept finding when we talked to people doing this every day for a living is that they continue to have questions about the stuff that we're talking about today. How do we, how do I make it look more photoreal? How do I make it look like it can integrate into a background? How do I make it more uh, emotional? How do I make it um, look like this thing I saw on TV? Right. And a lot of those answers are not you know, a button in Cinema 4D, it's a lot of these things that we're talking about today. Um, cameras, lighting, materials, um, lenses. And it's why, uh, you know, a lot of the plugins and, and asset packs and materials that we have with Grayscale Gorilla Plus are really focused on this because it affects the most people. So no matter if you do MoGraph and you have, you know, shiny spheres rolling around, which I love, or you have like product, more product driven or film driven, uh, stuff that our, our uh, customers do and, and Chad does, the the tools that we build are here to help you make all that stuff look better and work faster. And so we're excited to get into the next season. And if you want to uh, join us for those Q&As, we have a show, like I said, similar to this where we answer some questions. Um, yeah, check out the old episodes or they're not that old <laughs> from last month. Check those out and then subscribe because once we go back live, you'll get the notifications and all that stuff. And you'll be able to uh, ask questions too. So we hope to see you guys there. 
Yeah, I've I've been going through those things like candy. Like it's just so cool to have someone talk about their process. Like I I remember Chad was showing uh, about the new Gobo packs, the light uh, texture packs you guys uh, have released lately, where you can just throw a like a texture on a on a light, and it you get totally different reflections. And you were lighting a uh, a car, I believe it was. Oh, area light maps. Area light maps. That's yeah. The, that's the ticket. And uh, you know, ticket. And it's so interesting because, like I said, I've just started realizing, like, oh, studio lighting. Well, how do people in a studio actually light a car? And I, you Google, like, car lighting studio setup, and they have massive area lights. And what's it's, what is it doing? It's trying to accentuate and make, you know, make the car look sexy or something like that. And it's like, once you start understanding why things are done in real life, in real life, photography and real life lighting setups, that's when you can start having that light bulb moment of like, oh, that's exactly how I should be treating lighting in, in, in 3D. Like scale matters. Like, does it make sense to have a tiny product and have a massive, massive area light? No, <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense at all. And I feel like that's how it would, that's how I used to light is like, I'll throw an area light in, maybe I'll change the scale, but maybe it'll be de default. And right. maybe I won't even, have any uh won't even care about what the scale is of anything and with right. th third party renderers it's all about realistic scale so that now it's like i'm using that figure primitive guy like all the time it's like yeah is everything... i mean that's a handy primitive yeah it is it is it, is. it really is and, and just to build on what you're saying ej like the idea of of you know in 3d there's no limitation every i think people think scale is arbitrary and to to a certain extent it is but it needs to be grounded in a scale that you choose if you want to inform if you want some of the uh telltale signs to inform scale to your viewer like you said you wouldn't if you're shooting if you're like doing a 3d animation with a tiny character oh this is a good question for you actually jay like when you make one of your characters do you have an idea in your head how tall that character would be if it was sitting on your desk? Uh, that's a good, I mean, typically I'll model with that figure object as reference. And, you know, typically the characters I'll make are very cartoony. So maybe it'll be like half the size and like come up. But to you the have waist. an idea. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in your head when you're making it, oh, this is about, you know, three feet tall. Yeah. And so the decisions you make as you go through forward with that project should be based in that scale, right? Like if you're going to put a light on it, uh, you're probably not going to, you know, throw a light that's like the size of a, a, a of a thumbtack, you know, like you're going right. to use an appropriately sized light. Uh, but the beauty of 3D is that, and something that reality doesn't, um, that ha they have to worry about that we don't, which is uh, we can have, you know, lights that are gigantic and never seen by the camera. And in real life, that's a real problem. Like. That's a huge issue for uh, people lighting, uh, especially products and, and cars, to get an even reflection going over the entire car. They need a gigantic light uh, because if, if, they, if they don't and they try to get a light closer, it's going to be in the shot or something else might go awry. But for you and your character, you could use a, a light that's you know 10 feet wide for your character and put it two inches from your character and it won't show up in the shot if you click it off. There's tons of uh, DPs that would love that ability <laughs> to be able to just turn that off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I love the fact that like you start with a scale in mind and really that's, it's not that you need to like necessarily say, well, I'm going to work in real world scale, but you need to like know what your scale is. So you, that will inform your decisions. If you're doing anything with bokeh and aperture size and all that sort of thing, then you sort of need to work in a little bit more of a real world scale. Of course you can fake that stuff and it's not a big deal, but if you want the camera to do the heavy lifting on the aperture size and make it look real without having to do any of the math yourself, then it's helpful to be working in a real scale. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up scale too, because I feel like if there was a theme for a lot of these live shows we did, it, 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 it's that scale matters, just like you said, EJ. Like sometimes you'll nail the lighting You'll nail the angle and the camera and, and the, the, the composition, and then something is off. And for me, uh, uh, lately, it's been looking at the actual material scale, right? And saying, like, man, this just needs to be a little bit smaller uh, scale because 
leather wrapped around this object would have roughly this kind of texture based on the size of the texture of leather or um, or, or some of the uh, uh, surface imperfections that you wrap around have like these little thumbprints on them. And you're like, yeah. okay, a thumbprint would not be this big on this object. It would actually be smaller. And so that all these little cues set up, uh, you know, will, will, your brain will almost not even see them because we're so used to just seeing it in real scale in real life. And so we're, we have to always be aware of those things. So I've been finding like those scale differences with lighting, with scaling your materials exactly, you know, dialing the, that last 10% in can really help. Um, or even like Chad said, the, the, uh, the, the depth of field is a little bit too much for how big this object should be. For example, the bigger your object, roughly speaking, the less depth of field uh, should be in your scene, or, or let's just say it's harder to get more shallow depth of field um, when, when that's happening. All those little cues tell your brain, like, this isn't real. And that's always that thing we're trying to fight, like how to make it more real, how to make it more real. So scale, what, what a huge one that I'm glad we, uh, we could talk about. And it's something we yeah. dive really deep into a lot of those uh, other YouTube videos as well. Can't tell you how many times I've used that finger uh, fingerprint smudge thing, and the fingerprints are like massive, and you only realize <laughs> it later. Like, son of a, <laughs> Darn it. that's a giant hand. Uh, if you get real I, close to it and put it on your screen, you can actually log into Chad's phone. So well, there you go, yeah, dude. You just why, blew, why you blowing you up my fingerprint? <laughs> <laughs> you just need to do like a face pack as well, so you can like in the future oh my God. Where you need to read his face. First pack. His iPhone. I know he doesn't first have an iPhone, pack. so he doesn't even have that. <laughs> Middle name pack. The, fir the first pass at uh, our um, surface imperfections with the smudges and stuff, I was like showing it to my wife, and she's like, wait a minute, so are, is, that, is that your actual fingerprint? And I'm like, oh, shit. And I like went back in and like changed all the fingerprints <laughs> on every <laughs> single one. Uh, like, Nick, yeah. give me your hand real quick. Yeah. Uh, what is it yeah, for? Nothing. Just, like, Don't worry about it. Yeah. Let's maybe, uh, and I just want to mention again that at the end of this, in about 10 or so minutes, we're going to be doing a giveaway for one year of GSG Plus. So definitely stick around if you're in the chat there. Uh, let's maybe pivot over to uh, GSG and GSG Plus and, and what's going on over there. I know there's a lot of exciting uh, new things happening. It feels like all the time now. You guys had a big announcement back in April, but even since then, there's been a lot. So if you want to get us up to speed with all the exciting news. It's uh, it's been a lot of stuff, Chad. You're gonna have to uh, remind me if I forget something. But if you haven't checked out um, what's, you know, what's new at Grayscale Gorilla, there's been so much over the last year. Um, so about two years ago, we launched uh, Grayscale Gorilla Plus, which is uh, the way to get absolutely everything we have to help you uh, light, add materials, set the correct lenses, all the a lot of stuff we talked about today much quicker and much more realistically in Cinema 4D. And just like where Chad and I, you know, were working together uh, 10 plus years ago in production, we wanted to start making tools for 3D artists that helped get this stuff done faster, that looked more realistic, that helped us focus on the things that mattered and, and you know, grab a, a, just a great looking material when we needed it and not have to build everything from scratch. So that's kind of the overall idea behind Grayscale Grill Plus. It's it's the supercharged tool set for Cinema 4D to help you get all, a lot of this stuff done faster. And Grayscale Gorilla Plus is the ability to use absolutely everything we have, all of our material collections, all of these uh, surface imperfections, HDRIs, professionally captured <laughs> HDRIs, um, and of course a ton of training as well and to, uh, to get you up to speed and plugins, man. I, I ran out of breath, and I, I know. thank you, Chad. It's, it's a lot of stuff, dude. Don't worry. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. So, of course, all of our plugins are included, including Lightkit Pro, which will help for more of these um, studio lighting things we talked about today. If you're getting into third-party rendering, we have excellent guides to Redshift, Octane, and Arnold to get you started right within Plus. Um, a lot of awesome MoGraph uh, training as well. Um, but the real thing, if you haven't checked out Grace Go Gorilla in a while, are these new material collections. Uh, that Chad and his team have been uh, building over the last year are just um, the the best in the industry, frankly. Uh, 
if you're looking for photo reel looking materials that you could drag and drop you don't have to assemble them you don't have to put all the nodes together you just drag and drop it on your scene and scale it properly that's all you need to do um you're ready to go so chad fill me in with some of the actual packs and stuff that we've been uh adding over the last uh year because i have my favorites like metal um the area light maps you mentioned are are some of my favorite and of course uh hdri link and some of the new hdri collections have been huge yeah. in 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 my stuff but uh chad add a add a, a few more of the recent stuff that we've been adding so this last plus release i think was was pretty amazing because it kind of focused in on metal and one thing that i think a lot of artists struggle with is how to make reflective services look good so we wanted this release to kind of help artists tackle that so it starts off with like really good metal materials so we released a bunch of like super high quality metals all everything from like oily metal to clean metal, to stainless steel, brushed metal, patterned metal, all these different metals right there for all three renders, Arnold, Redshift, and Octane. So that starts with that. But then on top of that, you need to be able to light metal in a way that that uh, that works for your client. And it's really hard to light metal because metal isn't really being lit, it's just reflecting stuff. So a while back, we released uh, a, a nice HDRI pack called Pro Studios Metal. Uh, it might have been like two years ago at this point. And so that was a really great HDRI pack that's built to make reflections on metal look great. But we wanted to go a step further and see if we could make even better looking metal HDRIs. So we released in this last drop with the metal materials a new volume to Pro Studios Metal. So it's volume two and it's got some really great uh, lights in there. Literally a lot of times if I'm doing metal, I'm starting with one of those and sometimes it's just like, that's all I need. So it's a really robust set of H drives with the metal materials, which have been great. And then we've been building off of this. Uh, we've been building on our uh, our surface imperfection collections and adding more to that as well. So we've got now, I think, uh, scratches, smudges, and crust. We've got some more coming up that I can't talk about. But in conjunction with the metal materials and the HDRIs, you can use these surface imperfection maps to make your metals look more crusted and beat up and scratched if you want to. And it's all right there in plus. And then, of course, I think in that release, too, uh, we started experimenting with like smaller, more, I guess, um, fun kind of uh, packs. And we, we put out a nice little pack of neon lights, neon light materials. Uh, and then in, in addition to that, just for fun, we did an entire alphabet letter set model of uh, neon lights, like the actual like light itself and little plugs and all the little clips and all that stuff. So you can spell out whatever you want, you know, drag the scene file in, grab the A, the B, whatever, and use our neon materials on those to create neon signs or whatever. We just thought that was kind of like a fun little thing to do. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of the the two like or the I guess three or four latest things that we that we release. But we're always putting more stuff into the platform. Materials and assets are a huge part of it. And I can't really talk too much about what we have coming up. But you definitely want to be a member because there's some really killer stuff coming very soon. Any yeah. hints? Any secret phrases? Any Oh uh, boy, word. I know Jacqueline will be really mad if I let the cat out of the bag here. Um, if you've been paying attention, we do slip up from time to time on our live streams. So it, it, you may have seen it in the interface somewhere here or there. Uh, but yeah, we, we have a lot of really exciting stuff. I mean, obviously, we're really passionate about uh, cameras, lighting, textures. Uh, just the detail stuff, the filmmakery kind of stuff around 3D. So uh, there'll be more of that stuff, and, yeah, and it, hopefully, it, it's kind of built around looking at what our uh, our customers and, and 3D professionals in general need, right? So uh, we'll be we'll actually get a question from um, you know one of our members, and we're like, wait, that's a that's a great idea for a, a collection. And what's really great about the team and the way we have everything set up now is we can go from that's a great idea to creating the best in class material collection for, for that type of thing, like neons or the metals, for example. And then what's great about Plus is it's uh, it's ready for our members with a click of a button and it's on your machine if you want it as well. So 
we made it super easy to just download everything we got so that you can get back to work and using this stuff rather than a complex install and zip files and all that stuff we made it really easy it actually goes right into cinema 4d in a little um uh, interface uh, our own library and you can just drag and drop from there so the, the idea is really that's huge yeah it's it's so it's so huge and if if um if you haven't checked it out too uh it also somebody was asking in the comments about the lens scripts i was talking about earlier the ability to choose those lenses little script and plug-in ideas like that are also included they're all there to help you out and you can get started it's it's 49 bucks to get started um and i know a lot of uh, your audience is students and learning and and really just getting into this stuff we also have a education program it's 50 percent off if you're a student it's a non-commercial license if you're just learning, but you could use all the stuff we just talked about today. Start using, uh, you know, start learning how to light things and 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 add materials to your scene, just like we talked about today, and use all the same stuff uh, that the pros use uh, for half off. So definitely, uh, I think there may be a link in the chat, but um, just type education, Grayscale Gorilla, and that should pop up as well. Yeah, GSG Plus is like such an amazing resource to have at your fingertips because, you know, previously you would just grab HGRIs from this site and light maps on from this site and you have your folder structure and you have to dig through everything and you can't see what the heck it looks like. So it's nice to have that browser. That browser is amazing. Whoever worked on that, like chef's kiss, like it's amazing <laughs> just to have everything at your f fingertips and view everything and you could just your one-stop shop for everything you want the surface imperfections now like that's so awesome to have literally anything you could possibly want uh in yeah that was a huge that was really important for yeah. us because i know and we all know the pain that you just described of like where did i put that one thing that i used on that one job and it, it having i can't stress enough how important it is to have that stuff just like you know a, a, a quick mouse move away and, and just it's right there and it's searchable and you can just start playing around like that to me when we, you know, sort of like got that first version of the plus library built and we were testing it. I think we all like we're on Slack going, oh, my God, this is like a game changer for us internally just to be able to like grab stuff and like do things. So we kind of think like if it if it's really working for us, we really think it'll work well for our customers. So that's kind of how we approach everything yeah and it's such a huge thing to especially for people getting into third-party renders for the first time because it has arnold octane redshift materials and of course all the imperfections all that stuff is universal you can use it for anything and uh really excited to announce that for any student taking cinema 40 ascent this upcoming session they are going to get a gsg plus trial free throughout the length of the class. So they're gonna be learning in Ascent, they're learning Redshift, learning Octane for the first time, and they're gonna have this massive wealth of assets, like professional assets to be able to use and play around. I can't thank you guys enough for hooking that up for us. And it's gonna be such a nice little play playground for uh, students that are just maybe using their first uh, Redshift materials or Octane materials to be able to pick apart and see how everything works and have surface imperfections and light maps and stuff that they probably maybe have never used before and have it all at their fingertips. So really excited about that. Yeah, we're, uh, we're excited to partner again. We're excited, excited to partner with you guys too. And, uh, you know, you said something extra important that anybody taking that class um, should definitely do, which is install everything, start using these materials, start using the, the, the same tools the pros use, and then when you see something that you like, maybe it's a preset or a light or the way that something looks on your screen, you don't, you just have to, uh, you always go to that uh, preset. You can also study why, just like we talked about earlier, study why it looks good. So open up the nodes in the materials, open up uh, how this uh, HDR was built and, and expand it and see how the lighting is set up. And so it, it's as much of a learning tool as it is a production tool. Of course, if you're under a deadline, you may just want to use it and click it and move on. But when you're learning, like uh, obviously a lot of your students are are doing, it is really nice to be able to open all this stuff up and see how it's all built as well. So I, I would encourage anybody taking the course to install it and, and just start playing with it. 
you I uh, forget how long the trial is, but you have a free trial while you're in the in the uh, course. Yeah. And um, and and as always, if you have questions about any any of that stuff, join us on our Q and A's and hit up our uh, Slack channel as well, um, where we're always you know our customers and our kind of uh, crew is always in there learning from each other and helping each other out as well. Awesome. And uh, another, you know, GSG is so giving. And we're going to announce the winner of that uh, one year of GSG Plus. Ooh. And the winner is Jermaine Barker. So thank you so much for tuning in and congratulations. Congrats. Yeah. Um, is there anything else, any other news that we should be aware of, GSG Plus or GSG in general? You guys are starting the live streams up soon. Yeah, we're taking a, a little summer break. The team has been absolutely rocking it um, for the last couple of years and uh, uh, taking a little bit of time here. Finally, a little bit of summer break here. Um, of course, customer support, everything will be running, but we're just taking a little time off of the live show. I think we'll be back basically when school starts back up. You know, we'll, we'll kind of pull up the Q&A back up again. And again, we're going to answer... We, we answer your guys' questions. So bring good questions and we'll <laughs> we'll answer them. Uh, just follow us on YouTube. They'll let you know when we're going live. Um, anything else? We have a huge new update coming to Plus um, uh, relatively soon that I think will, uh, for existing Plus members, obviously they get it all uh, on day one. And if you've been check if you haven't checked out what we've been adding to Plus in the last uh, couple months, Definitely go look at some of the uh, latest things, and come join us. We're uh, we're we, we're we're trying to help you guys uh, speed up your production and uh, help help make uh, better looking renders. It's our mission: better looking renders around the world. <laughs> make that a t-shirt. Print <laughs> needs a little work. It needs a little, yeah. little, little tightening. Yeah, it's a little wordy. We'll it's a little up. wordy. A little wordy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for stopping by. It's always uh, great to have an excuse to like get paid to talk to you guys. So I, I love it. Um, wait, you're getting paid? Gonna, I think. <laughs> hey, well, wait I a should, minute. I should be. I should thank be getting you. that. TJ, I miss you, man. I'll, I miss I'll, you I'll, guys too. Hope to see great. you guys soon. Super um, excited to see you. Yeah. Hope, NAB. NAB. Just the corner, right? Yeah. Yep. We are going to NAB. So. If anybody out there would like to come hang out with us, we'll be there. Yeah. And who's we'll go, who's some... going to NAB in the chat? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's let gonna me see. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a long time coming. October, right? Yeah. Feels plus like a long members, time away, I, but... If, if plus members come to NAB and they find me, I'm going to give you a little prize. Oh. You're going to hold them to that, too. Little, little prize. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, just a few announcements before we wrap it up. Uh, number one, so, uh, School of Motion summer session starts on Monday, but there is still time to sign up for any of our classes, including some of the classes we mentioned in the stream, Cinema 4D Ascent, where we teach a little bit of uh, third-party rendering, lighting, dynamics, uh, rigging, character rigging, all that kind of good stuff. Cinema 4D Basecamp, if you're completely new to Cinema 4D and you're like, what is all these cool people doing? Using Cinema 4D, I want to get in on that. So if you're, if you're totally new to 3D and have been wanting to learn Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D Basecamp is the class for you. And we've, talk, we've been talking a lot about uh, thinking like a DP, thinking like a digital uh, photographer and uh, uh, or director of photography and a, and a digital photographer, why not? Uh, lights, camera, render, if you think your lighting is awful and you want to up your game as far as cinematography goes and thinking more like a cinematographer, Lights, Camera, Render is the beefiest class out there that teaches all those foundational uh, skills about lighting, camera moves, all that good stuff. It's definitely opened my eyes to paying more attention to like movies and actually knowing what things are called and stuff like that. Um, also, lastly, we just announced the uh, release of, uh, not the not announced the release, but it's out now. Uh, our new hold frame workshop from Sakani Solomon. He is freaking killing it every single day. And it was super exciting to uh, get walked through his uh, demo reel project, which just played right there. And basically we figure out what kind of was his thought process behind it. Just both Ryan Summers and I uh, co-host it. And we dive into each and every shot in that project and see why he why he came up with it? How he 
uh, executed it. And uh, that man is just a, a wealth of knowledge. And I've had my mind blown many times throughout that uh, hold frame. So and we actually just wrapped up recording a hold frame today. That is super exciting, but I can't say anything more about it. Um, but that's why my voice is a little hoarse right now, because I've been talking for like seven hours now. Uh, but thank you everyone for uh, hanging out with us. It's always good to connect with the School of Motion audience and of course with the GSG team. Uh, thank you guys so much and hope to see you back here again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, guys. Everybody. Thank you, EJ. Thanks, EJ. Bye, guys.